Hello and welcome back to the Man Cave Hobby. So today's video is a lengthy one. I'm going to put an index down below so you can just skip all the stuff you're not interested in and get to the stuff you are. It's lengthy because I'm covering INAV. I'm covering INAV and everything that I've learned about INAV, I'm not an expert, but everything that I've learned to set up my wife's first quadcopter from beginning to end. And maybe you'll gleam something off of that. You know, and that's what this channel is about. This channel is an extension of my hobby. It's my thoughts, my feelings, my opinions about products and whatever not. There's no shilling here. There's no selling of anything. If somebody gives me something or, or a manufacturer gives me something, I'm straight up with you about it. I'm not going to hide that. It's not about selling anything here. That's what my point is, right? Um, so let's start with this. This was given to me by Billy D60 from RC Groups. And the story behind that is I made a video here about a month and a half ago to talk about the DJI Plastic Fantastic FPV drone. And I wanted to get one for my wife. I wanted that to be her first drone because it's a flying robot, right? It's less frustration, less problems. And she gave me a hard no. And the reason why it's $1,300 for the drone, it's $300 for the batteries, it's $200 for the, the DJI care thing that still carries a $250 deductible if you do wreck it and have to send it back. And she's just like, hell no. I, 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 it might not be something I'm interested in. It might not be something I'm going to stick with. And besides that, you have enough stuff downstairs that you can make me my first drone. And she's right. Well, Billy D60 seen that video. And um, he's like, you know what? I got something for you. It's, it's based off of the Diatone uh, Taycan. And, but it's something I put together myself. So he's got the T-Motor 1507s in here. He's got a 60-amp 4-in-1 ESC. Really nice flight controller. He flew it twice once he put it together, and it was a snooze fest. And he's like, it's something I'm not going to fly. It's not, I'm not really interested in anymore. It's just going to sit here on the shelf. I'll just give this to you for your first, you know, if your wife's first drone, for all the help that you've given us on RC Groups with the Shark Bite system. And I thought that was really nice of him. I offered him money. He said no. I offered him money like four times. He said no. I offered him shipping. He said no. And then on top of that, he made me this GPS mount because I said I want to put GPS on this and use iNav so that I can have alt hold and I can have position hold with this and I'll give you money for that. And he said no. And this is a really nice little mount here. I mean, beautiful, beautiful job. So I'm going to call this the Billy D60 because he made this thing. And... Not only that, when you think Diatone, Taycan, Taycan is a Porsche name. And when you think in Porsche, you're thinking speed, agility, it's Porsche, right? This is not quite like that. This is more like 72 Volkswagen. You know, it's sturdy and, and reliable and slow. And it, it's like a 72 VW with an alignment problem and a missing cylinder and no mufflers whatsoever because this thing is loud it's loud enough that it actually made her kind of scream a little bit when it first started up um i'm going to show you her, her first flight video today but the thing i do like about this is that it is solid i mean it's built like an absolute bridge you got carbon on top carbon on bottom you got uh, aluminum on the front for your camera I mean, this thing is built, and it is a three-inch heavy whoop, so it can handle a little bit of wind because it is heavier, and you don't have to worry about bent props, right? And that's kind of important for a beginner. It is slow and steady because it is a sin whoop. It's made for slow, steady video flight, and but you can still power loop it. I did in rate mode. Uh, you can still power loop trees. You can still do flips and rolls with it. So, and the parts are readily available and they're inexpensive. I got a full set, a full frame set for this, along with a couple of foams and plastic inserts in the whole nine yards for backups. But I don't think I'll ever use them. So it's going to be something that's going to just collect around here. Um, so yeah, let's get to them on the bench. I'm going to show you what I've done with this, the different ways I, I put the different parts in. I put a shark bite in here. Um, and I'm going to go through iNav and show you everything that I learned about iNav. And then I'm going to show you her flight video. All right. So let's talk about the Taycan. It is pronounced Taycan, by the way, not Taycan. I know, I know, I know, whatever. Anyway, what I like about this build is the fact that you don't have to remove all of the carbon to get to your electronics. You can just remove the center plate. And that is so nice. Now, every one of these kind of designs have one inherent problem. And that is your USB is buried. 
So I would highly recommend picking one of these up. I'll put a link down below where I found it, non-affiliated, of course. Um, this is crucial to have with these because there's no real way to safely put in your USB cable, and you're going to need to get to this port a lot when you're using iNav, especially when you're first setting it up. When you do get these, or actually any USB cable that you're going to be using with your flight controllers, I would recommend grinding off the hooks. Some of these hooks can be so aggressive that they can get stuck in your flight controller and then you're trying to jerk them out. And I've actually had a situation where one got stuck and it ended up lifting the USB right off my flight controller, ruining my flight controller. So what I do with these is I just grind them off. And they still fit nice and snug. I don't have to worry about them falling apart. This is a soft mount uh, stack, so I, I have to kind of support the one end of it. And it's still a very snug fit. And you still have to sort of wiggle it to get it out of there. So it's still really snug. You don't have to worry about it falling out on its own. But you don't have to worry about getting stuck either. So that's one of my recommendations. So let's remove the middle plate here since it's so easy. And let's take a look at the overall build. Now, Billy D60, luckily, I didn't know he did this. But luckily, he used a really good flight controller. This is a Maytech. This is the 722 Mini. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an F7. Um, it's got plenty of processing power for iNav, which is very, very important. Also really important is that iNav has a target for this. That's something you have to pay attention to. You can't just get any willy-nilly uh, flight controller out there. You have to make sure iNav has a target for it. Okay, So go to iNav's page and they'll, they'll show you the, tar the, the ones that they can support. This happens to be one of them. So it's a 722 Mini. But unfortunately, they don't make this one anymore. They updated it. And they updated it to a 722 Mini like SE. The problem with that is that it has now an onboard barometer. <laughs> and the problem with that is this here has everything included. It, it has your GPS antenna. It has your barometer and your compass all in one. Three wires to the FC, you're done. It's that simple. But now if you have a barometer on your flight controller and you have a barometer here, it's not going to work. So that's a real bummer. What I like about this flight controller also is that all of the ports are on the outside and there's a ton of them. There's actually five ports. Um, it's got plenty of processing power. I mean, this is a really good flight controller and iNav had a target for it. So that's really important. Um, let's start with the front here. So... I use the Shark Bite, and I would highly recommend not using Shark Bite right now. I would recommend using analog. The reason why is right now, Shark Bite cannot support all of the OSD functionality of iNav, and that's really important, especially the warnings. With, with Shark Bite, you get no warnings. You don't get a low battery warning. You don't get any warning. And that's really important. You also don't get a lot of other functionality that you might want. You do get the, you'll see on the OS, on the OSD uh, coming up, um, but you don't get, you get the home point, you get the arrow, you get the battery voltages, things like that. Um, you do get your height and, and stuff, but you don't get the warnings. And so when she was flying, I really wasn't paying attention to what she was doing and all of a sudden she's like, uh, there's a problem here. And I said, what's the problem? And she said, I think the battery died. And I went running over there, and sure enough, a brand new pack, slightly puffed. It did get down to 2.8. Um, yeah, so that was my bad. I don't know why it did that, because I do have the battery set up properly in iNav, but I don't know. It should have killed the whole machine at 3 volt, but it didn't. So, yeah. So, if you're going to use, and then right after that, she was smart enough to start paying attention. I didn't show her the battery voltages or what they did. You know, there, there was a lot. I was in a rush today because today, or I was in a rush yesterday because today snowed and I wanted to get the flight footage out there. I wanted to get her out in the field. So I didn't show her. And that's, it was my bad, but she was smart enough afterwards to start paying attention to the voltage. Um, so with the shark bite, if you do want to use it on any one of your machines, this is the 20 by 20. This is a prototype from about a year ago. 
and the prototype ones and the early ones did not have the the heavier voltage regulator and unfortunately they will burn up they they will get a voltage spike and there's a good chance they're going to burn up carl at math has had to replace hundreds of them because of this i did warn carl from the get-go when he was designing this and the whoop board that they do have to be 2s first of all um, because a lot of flight controllers do have an 8-volt pad on them, so you can just connect it to the 8-volt pad. As long as you have a 2-amp BEC, you're fine. And, well, they didn't listen. So they went 2S to 6S and connected to the battery, and that's a big mistake. As we know, our motors, especially larger motors, can get voltage spikes, and you can just get voltage spikes by just plugging in the battery. It doesn't matter how much capacitor you have on the back of it. So what I did here is I use the VBAT. I don't have an 8-volt pad, so I use the, the filtered VBAT pad off of my flight controller. And, it, you know, being filtered, it goes through the battery, goes through the capacitor, goes through the 4-in-1 ESC, into the FC, and then out, so it's filtered. And then I went into a BE, or in, into a buck converter. So what a buck converter is, you can get these on Amazon, I'll put a link down below, is they take DC in, DC out, and it's adjustable. So I just adjusted it to 10 volts. It's done. So now I have a lot more protection here. I don't have to worry about my VTX burning up on me. On top of the VTX, I put a plastic shelf with some standoffs, and that's where I got the buck converter. And you notice I put everything in front. On the on the take can, or the, I'm sorry, on the Tycon, um, there are 20 by 20 mounting holes in the front and back, so it's natural, you know, to be able to put in the um, the Shark Bite system or even the DJI system. So that's great. Um, and the DJI system also has the same problems as the Shark Bite as of right now. But anyway, it's really kind of nice. Um, but on the top here, I put a shelf and I just double st sided sticky tape these things down away from this unit here. You want to keep everything away from your GPS and your compass. It's, it's crucially important. When I used to make camera drones back in 13, 14, 15, I learned the hard way. I did not isolate my GPS and my compass away from EMF and RF, and I ended up with a ton of flyaways and a, and a lot of problems. So I learned the hard way. So here I'm gonna show you a picture of what I did on the ducts back here. So on the ducts, I wrapped the ducts with this copper tape. Now once again, in on Amazon, Amazon's starting to turn into the Costco of the online world. So you can't just buy this in a couple of feet. You gotta buy 66 feet of it. So now it's gonna become a family heirloom. I'll pass it down to generation to generation. But I wrapped this multiple times right around here. And then what I did is I put a ground wire. I soldered a ground wire because this is actual copper. I grounded, I grounded it to the battery negative lead. Okay, so everything returns to ground. On this unit here, and I love this unit. I'll put the name up here. I'll put the name right here. Um, with this all-in-one unit, the cord, there's only three wires that you need that go from here to, to the flight controller. Well... I was also having some interference problems there, of course. So what I did is I wrapped it in this stuff. I got it off Amazon. I'll put a link down below. Once again, you have to buy like enough to, you know, I don't know. It's crazy. Um, so I only needed about this much of it. Spread it apart. Feed the wires into it. And then ground it. This is tin copper, so you can just ground it to your battery negative lead. And then wrap it in shrink wrap. Done. What that did is it isolated this unit from a lot of RF and EMF. And it made it so, before I did all of this insulation, I was only getting about, it would take about three minutes and I was getting nine satellites. And then when I took off, it would drop back down to around seven, which is the bare minimum. After doing this, now I get, well, you'll see in the video, I get 14, 15 satellites right away, like within one minute. And as I'm flying along on a clear day, I can get up to 18. So it was, it was just done. That's it. So that's the build, guys. That's all I did. That's the secret sauce. I would highly recommend this unit. Make sure you have a flight controller that iNav supports. It has a target for it. does not have a barometer on it. Maybe have a black box. Black box is very important. You have your little beeper here. Even though you can't hear it with how loud this thing is, this is the loudest beeper ever. And yet I still can't hear it for over the top of these of this racket that this thing makes guys if you want to build this if you're a new person i would recommend getting this they're 200 dollars analog version 
comes with the flight it comes with the uh, rx already in it and then get yourself one of these for 75 bucks and get yourself a cheap helmet like the uh eashine 800ds for 80 bucks or the um if you want real nice ones you can get the scouts for 200 dollars. for 500 dollars, you could build something that flies a lot like the new dji plastic fantastic drone you have alt hold altitude hold you have position hold you have return home the whole nine yards it's really not complicated to put this together that's why this is a lengthy video i would recommend it i mean i, I would recommend the helmet called x in it but they basically stole the design from fat shark and i'm sorry i just cannot support that kind of behavior so anyway let's get down to inav okay we're here with inav I'm going to try to burn through this as fast as I possibly can here, guys, but still get the relative information for you. Um, the first thing I would do is get yourself a six-foot USB cable. The reason why is because your magnetometer or your compass um, is so sensitive that it would it'll even pick up the speakers of your laptop or your computer and or your monitor and so on and so forth. Anything that's that's Anything that has an EMF, okay, electronic magnetic field, or even metal around you, I mean, it's that sensitive. And if you don't get it away from these sources, you're going to have a very, very difficult time setting up your compass. The second thing that I would recommend is get on Google Earth and find out where true north is in relative to your house. So in, in my house, my eastern wall is actually due north. So as long as I'm lining up to what looks like I'm parallel with my eastern wall of my house, well, then I know I'm pointing north. Okay, so let's just get in here real quick. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is navigation is not safe. You're going to have an X there. You can have a lot of X's over here, and that's perfectly okay, including the accelerometer calibrated, because you haven't done any of this stuff yet. Now, what I want you to do is pay attention to the quadcopter. When you pitch it up, it goes up. If you just have a box, try to reload it. Um, and if you go down, you go down, right, left. You notice it doesn't do any funny maneuvers or anything like that. It just acts like a quadcopter should, just like in beta flight. And the reason I want you to notice that is because that's going to help you later on setting up the, the compass. Under ports, you want to set up your ports. You, you should know how to do that. should not have any explanation. You can see that my RX is set on a serial. That's why I had to in enable it in the configuration screen. Okay, we've already done that. Uh, so let's go to the calibration real quick. We gotta set some things up. So the very first box right here, 256 is correct. Uh, now, on your flight controller loop time, you can go to four and eight, but some guys have said that they've had some issues with going to four, depends on your flight controller. Now I have an F7, so it shouldn't have a problem with that. Um, as you can see, my CPU load down here on the bottom is like 3%, so it's perfectly okay. Um, but I set it at 2. It just seems to be safe. This is a beginner quadcopter after all. Here in sensors, you have MPU 6000. That's your gyro. I actually have two gyros, but that's your gyro. That's typically what your gyro will be. If yours, it depends on your flight controller, okay, but that's typical. Read the manual of your flight controller and find out which one you have. Under the magnetometer, which is your compass, if you have the all-in-one, which I highly recommend like I have because everything's included, um, you want to set that to MSP because it's going to be communicating through your ports. And the same thing with the barometer. You want to go to MSP. Okay. As we go down, unless you didn't, uh, unless you set up your flight controller in a different orientation than stock, which is the arrow pointing forward to the quadcopter, you don't have to mess with any of these things. Um, and that includes the mag. Just leave the mag alignment alone right now. So GPS for navigation and telemetry should be turned on. And once again, if you're using the all-in-one, you want to set that to MSP. Uh, ground assist type should be disabled. And GPS uses Galileo satellites. What that means is that you're using Galileo satellites plus the GPS satellites. So it just gives you extra satellites, so why not use it? So just turn that on. And then over here on the other side, you want to set up your battery voltage, of course. However, you, you know, it is for you if it's on your ESC or ADC, whatever you want to do there. Same thing with the current sensor. Um, and then down here in these boxes, 
So enable CPU-based serial ports. The reason mine's enabled is because my RX uses a, a serial port. Um, telemetry output, you want to turn that on, if you're, especially if you're running SharkBite or any intelligent type VTX. Um, otherwise, I don't get my OSD. Uh, black box flight data recorder, if you have one, turn that on. Uh, that helps you with tuning later on. And then enable motor and servo output. This is very, very important. If you don't enable this, your quadcopter will never fly. OSD should be turned on, of course. And then profile selection for TX stick command. Okay, so I'm not sure about this one. I don't know if this is just for the profiles, like if you set up different profiles. I'm thinking what this is for is that so you can use your TX to give commands to let's say get into the, the different sub menus. So like when you're out in the field and you have this quadcopter, you want to get into um, compass calibration mode because wherever you fly, you have to do a compass dance. And I'll show you what the compass dance is later on. And you want to make sure when you do it, you're not around metal buildings, you have metal piping in the ground or rebar or anything like that because that will throw off your compass and you could end up with a flyaway especially if you're doing return to home. So save. And now we're going to come back here and I'm going to show you the first screen again. Okay. So I reset everything so that you would see this. So now everything's set and you still got some red boxes over here. But what I want you to pay attention to is how your quadcopter reacts. So now I'm just, I'm just pitching straight up and you can see my quadcopter is doing some funny things here. I'm pitching down and it's moving on its own on the display here. It's really, really strange, right? Well, what that is, is that my compass is not calibrated, first of all. And then secondly, here's how these, comp here's how these things work. Even though there's an arrow on the actual all-in-one or any GPS unit, compass unit out there, it doesn't mean squat. I don't even know why they put the arrow on there. You're thinking the arrow is just like your flight controller. So wherever it's pointing, that should be where the compass is pointing. Well, no, that's not the case. It really doesn't mean dick all. And that's the most confusing thing ever. I don't know why they even bother putting the arrow on there. So what I found out is that my compass is actually 90 degrees off. Or actually, yeah, it's 90 degrees off. Well, no, actually it's 270 degrees off. I take that back. 270 degrees off. Really, really strange, right? And that's why it's acting the way it's acting. But let's go down here to the calibration. So the very first thing you want to calibrate is your accelerometer. Now, I had a hell of a time with this. I could not get this to save. These boxes just kept saying zero, zero, and zero. They would never update. And I tried one step one, step two, three, four, five, and six. Well, I finally, after a couple of hours of frustration and not finding an answer out there online, I got frustrated and just tried step two. I tipped the quadcopter upside down first. It gave me a checkbox. I went to one, gave me a checkbox, and then three through six. Checkbox. And then it came up with a dialog box that said it's been saved. Congratulations or whatever, it's been saved. And then finally, these changed. And then I saved and reboot and went back and checked. And sure enough, it saved it. Okay. Your compass calibration. Well, let's just save that for one second here. Because I'm going to show you something over here to get this correct. Um, you're going to go to your sensors tab. And when you go to your sensors tab, you're going to have a lot of things checked. Uncheck everything besides the accelerometer and um, the magnetometer, which is your compass. I'm just going to start calling it compass from now on. Okay. So if I say compass, it's your magnetometer. Okay. You'll notice the accelerometer here. You got three boxes. You got an X, Y, and a Z. X is your pitch, Y is your roll, and Z is your yaw. Okay. Now, I want you to pay attention to this number if you have this blowing up and you're not watching it on the phone. It's going to be easy to see. If I pitch my quadcopter up, you can see the accelerometer is gaining in a positive direction all the way to 1. But yet, you look down below at the compass, the X hasn't changed. It's just, it's just sitting there at 0. But yet, Y is going up. Well, that's weird. Why would Y go up? That means the compass is increasing on its roll axis, not its pitch axis. Okay, so why would that be? Well, the reason that is, is because my compass is 90 degrees off, or 270 degrees off. It's 90 degrees off 
counterclockwise, 270 degrees off counterclockwise. Or, you know, do I got that right? No. 270 degrees off counter or clockwise and, and 90 degrees off counterclockwise. So that's what's going on here. That's why when I increase this, the roll axis on the compass is increasing as well. Same thing when I move down. Now, when I roll the quadcopter to the side, you'll notice that the Y on the accelerometer is now going down. It's now in the negative. But yet now you look at the compass and it gains in the positive. So that tells me right there that my, my compass is 90 degrees off one way or another. Okay, So we're going to correct that real quick. And also, too, with the mount that I have that made, was made by Billy D60, I have a 30-degree angle. So that's going to add a little complication there. So what you want to do is you want to go back to calibration here, and you want to you're going to have to guess. Now there's a lot of different options here. You got a, a clockwise, 270 flip, 180 flip, you know, cl clockwise, 90 flip, and the whole whole nine yards. Basically, you got to kind of guess it, guys. I mean, I, I, it's just the strangest damn thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to 270, okay, and I'm going to save and reboot. And let's see what it does now. Let's go back over here to the sensors, the sensor tab. Now let's see if it corrected it. So once again, I'm just looking at the X. I'm just looking at the pitch of both the accelerometer and the compass. So I pitch my quadcopter up. I'm in a positive direction. And now my magnetometer is in a negative direction on pitch, which is my compass. That is actually correct. So how it works is the accelerometer should be, when it's positive, the compass should be negative. And vice versa, if the, if the accelerometer is in the negative, the compass should be in the positive. Now let's do roll and make sure I got it correct that way. Okay, so I'm rolling to the left. It goes in the negative number, like round negative, let's just go to one. And down below here, on the compass, it's in a positive direction. So I guessed correctly, which I already knew. I didn't really guess correctly. It took me like three hours to figure this out. Same thing when I roll it to the right. Okay. Once again, I'm in the positive on my accelerometer on the roll, and I'm in the negative on the compass. That is absolutely correct. If I go yaw, yaw is kind of a weird thing. It doesn't really work very well on the yaw. you got to kind of tilt it a little bit. So I have positive numbers on my yaw, and I have negative numbers down below. Okay. Well, I already know that my compass is still not correct because I mounted mine at a 30-degree angle. But let's take a look at the setup here. Now, when you take a look at the setup, let's see if it's a little bit better. So I'm going to pitch up, and I'm going to pitch down. And you see it kind of wanders a little bit still. And I knew it would because it's 30 degrees off. Yeah, see, it wanders. And I also haven't calibrated my compass yet either. <laughs> so, excuse me. So, because I know it's 30 degrees off, I'm gonna, I can't, I don't have anything in here for that setting. As you can see, I can just only set it here. So I have it set to clockwise 270. So I know 270 is correct. So now I have to go to a CLI command. That's the only way I'm gonna be able to fix this because because my compass is on a 90 degree off of my quadcopter, well, now my 30 degree angle I have on my mount is sitting on the roll axis of the compass, not the pitch axis of the compass, if that makes sense to you. Because the compass is no longer, it's, it's not lined straight up with my quadcopter, like with my flight controller. It's off by 90 degrees. So if you turn your compass 90 degrees, and now you're going to mount it 30 degrees, you know, 30 degrees on a tilt. Well, that's going to be on its roll axis, right? Okay, so what we're going to do on that is we're going to set this back to default. Okay. And then we're going to get back in here. We're going to, do, we're going to, have, to we have to go into the CLI, CLI commands. So we, we're in the CLI now. And so 
here is what you have to do if you're going to have a custom alignment like this. So, well, first of all, we know that my mag yaw, okay, my magnetometer yaw, it's yaw at 270 degrees. So let's put that in here, and I'll show you the command for that. There it is, set align underscore mag underscore yaw equals 2700. Don't ask me why it's not 270, it's 2700. I don't know why. Now, if it was the opposite way, it would be like a 90, right? It would be like clockwise 90. If it was completely 180 degrees turned around, you know what I'm saying? But in this case, it's not. Um, I don't know what the flip is. If it's flipped upside down, I'm not sure what that command is, but I know you can look that up on INAV. So we're going to go ahead and hit enter on that, okay? And then the next command, well, I know it's on a yaw. It's yawed back, you know, or it's on its roll axis now, the compass is, by 30 degrees. So I got to set the um, roll of this thing by 30 degrees. So let me show you what that looks like. It's set align underscore mag underscore roll equals 300, not 30. Don't ask me why. Hit enter. Okay. And then just, just to make sure that it, I don't have anything funky in there, I just set the pitch alignment to zero at this point. All right, because it's not pitching. It's, you know, the, the, the compass is 90 degrees off, so it's not going to be pitching. If, if it was pitching, if you set the pitch here at anything other than zero, you're basically saying, well, on my mount, it's actually on its roll axis. So, that you know, it's, that's not going to make sense. Because it's 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 flat and the mount is equal with the frame, so it's not moving one way or another, you know, right or left. So that is the command that I have here. Um, so let's hit save. We're going to save this, and then the next step to check this to make sure it's absolutely accurate, we're going to have to do the compass dance. So let's just take a look here real quick, even though it's not okay. It is better. But you can see it's kind of like I'm just rolling to the left and it kind of corrects me a little bit. Okay, but it's better. And even though I'm in my basement, I already have 10 sats. That's kind of that's kind of crazy. So let's go to configure. I'm sorry, calibration. Let's go to cal compass calibration. Now we're gonna do a compass dance. You got 30 seconds to do this, which is plenty enough time. So we're going to click on this, and then at Compass Dance, we're going to hold our quadcopter away from anything metal and my laptop. So what you want to do is just pitch your quadcopter down all the way around until it's flat again, okay? And then do the same thing on your roll axis. Just roll it all the way over 360 degrees, and then you want to do a yaw. Doesn't matter which damn direction you do it. And then since you got 30 seconds, just, you know, go ahead and yaw out of your cord. This is just to get the cord so it's unraveled. Okay. And there you go. So now you're done. That's it. That's, that's the compass dance. So now let's take a look at this. So I'm going to go ahead and save and reboot. And let's see if we got this. I know it's correct because I've already done all this. It took me hours to figure this crap out. That's why I'm making this long video. Um, so you don't have to go through this crap. Um, so let's take a look. I'm going to hold my quadcopter away from my laptop, even though it's, it's still picking up my laptop speakers. It's really strange. I know where north is. That's my east wall. So I'm going to point the quadcopter on my north wall here. Okay. And see if that's correct. And that is absolutely correct. My heading is correct. And you can see it's not doing that funny thing anymore. When I, when I accurately roll it, it's not trying to correct anything. It's not moving on its own. But watch this. When I start moving towards the laptop, you can see it's starting to turn itself, even though I'm just going straight towards the laptop. And I go away from the laptop and look at it. It's correcting back to true north. That is crazy. 
that's how sensitive this this uh, compass is in this thing all right so now we have that done so let's move on to the next step here we, we've calibrated everything so in the setup screen we have calibrated the compass you should have a green check there you should have an accelerometer um, calibrated that should have a green check there if you are picking up sats um, which you can check right down here on their sats you're gonna get probably a green checkbox right here on navigation is safe um, so everything looks really good so let's just go ahead and go down to mixer tab okay so under the mixer tab we're running a quadcopter so you of course you want to select multi rotor okay and then over here you want to select your quad what, what is your quad and in fact when you first fire this up it's gonna give you all kinds of red boxes on the top like what am I connected to here so you might have to go to the screen first or you can grow it doesn't matter when you go there so quad X typical quadcopter okay you also have a mixer wizard let's take a look at that okay on the mixer wizard you can see which motor is which your right rear is motor run it's just your typical front right is motor two right rear left is motor three front left is motor four I'm just gonna exit out of that okay <laughs> then underneath here you should have motor one motor two motor three motor four already lined up okay that's it save and reboot let's go to output so outputs you want to enable the motor and servo output that's crucially impo important under D shot I wouldn't go any higher than 300 and you don't have to worry about servo refresh rate because we're not running servos stop motor on low throttle I would leave that off okay and then here you have your motor tab down here and you can check your motors and see whether or not they work and it should look just like this you shouldn't have a whole bunch of other stuff down here if you do go back to mixer and do the mixer wizard and save it okay it's that simple on that so let's go to presets now I love this part the presets are fabulous and this is what I used so under this I use you have the generic 3 inch quadcopter this sets up your PIDs for you generic 5 inch generic 7 inch generic 10 inch wow 10 inch that's crazy I selected 3 inch Cinewoop and believe it or not they were good I went out there in rate mode I flew around in rate mode without any assistance whatsoever and it was flying just fine especially in the wind so not too bad it kind of gives you a start so I select a 3 inch city whoop for this particular one and there you go on that fail safe okay now under fail safe what do you want it to do if you have a fail safe well I just want it to land I don't even want it to come back home I just want it to land that's it you can do drop where it just drops out of the sky you can do return home if you want to or you can do nothing PID turning because you've done the with you've done a little wizard there on how to uh, you know back here in the presets all right so your PID tuning should already be set up for you here take it out and fly it like you would a normal quadcopter and tune it if you would like to you have your rates all set right here so it's a little different than beta flight of course you got your filtering all right here okay and then you got this thing called mechanics and honestly you got air mode threshold and all kinds of stuff I didn't do any of this you know I, I just didn't it's, it flies fine advanced tuning let's take a look at that so advanced tuning is what do you want this thing to do on the navigation settings okay so user control mode is altitude and you want your max nav you know what, what do you want your max navigation speed to be meaning that how fast can this thing go when you're using let's say the different modes like um, alt hold and position hold okay and you can look up all of these later if you'd like to um, you can use the mid throttle for alt hold I don't do that because it depends on the quadcopter some quadcopters can get off the ground as low as a quarter of a, of a throttle stick and some require a little bit more than half so if you set this where you're using mid throttle for alt hold and then you turn alt hold off 
and let's say your your stick is only a quarter, it's going to drop. Or if your mid throttle is higher than the mid stick, well now it's going to shoot straight up. So I just leave that off. Okay, hover throttle set at 1500. You can adjust that. Just depends on where you're at with your sticks when your quadcopter is hovering. If it's quarter stick, of course you're going to knock this down, and if it's more than half, you're going to raise it up. And that way, when you turn off alt hold, it doesn't shoot up or drop to the ground. So return to home and landing settings. Okay, so return to home altitude mode max. Um, yeah, you can do at least linear descent and all that stuff. Um, it's just you know the maximum return to home. Um, return to home altitude. And this is all in centimeters, so I just figured out uh, if you if you live in a Western country like the United States, which is the only dumb country left that doesn't use metric. Well, I think they, yeah, you know, I think even in England they use metric. But I just figured out on a calculator what this means. Fifteen hundred is around fifty-five feet or something like that. Um, return home to altitude. I leave that to zero. You want it to land on the ground, obviously. Climb before return to home. That's kind of important. Um, do you want to? climb before it returns to home or do you want it just to shoot straight at you and not, not only that guys when you're doing return to home remember it's going to return wherever it try you know took off so if you throw it right in front of you and you're sitting in a chair and you turn on return to home well it's not the most accurate beast in the world so it could actually try to land on you or on your stuff so when you're flying these things you know and you want the home point to be somewhere go plug it out you know plug it in somewhere away from you um, land after, you know, return to home always. And, and that's what these settings are for. I'm not going to go through every single one of them. Um, it's the same thing over here. I mean, you just, oh, minimum GPS satellite for a valid fix, six. That's important. And that actually, I want that to be seven. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and change that. Because if it's not, seven should be the minimum, not six. So let's go back in here. And what I like about iNav is when you do do a reboot, it goes right back to your screen. I, I like that. It's really convenient. So programming, we're not going to pay attention to. We don't care. And, of course, your receiver, same thing. This is where you set up your receiver. Um, you know, you set up the box here, whether whatever it is, T-A-R or whatever the other one is. I never have the other one. Or A-E-T-R, basically altitude, elevator, throttle, and... Um, you know rotate i think it would be it's not yaw it's rotate uh i think mine yeah okay so receiver model mine's on a serial you got s bus serial port inverted whatever if it's inverted like if you have like an fr sky with an inverted s bus you would turn that on um re serial reserver half duplex same thing i just leave it on auto on that and here's your throttle mid stick and expos and all that stuff if you want to use that your different modes okay so let's talk about that of course I have an arm mode I have a horizon mode for her it's a stabilized mode and I have air mode set so because air mode I have it over here in the configuration where it's not always on okay um, so different modes. so I have air mode here and here and then farther down you have a nav alt hold now I'm playing around in here so don't copy my settings I'm kind of playing around with different settings here um, one of the reasons why is because I noticed in all hold mode, we have a, I live in a windy city, 145 days of the year, there's wind above five miles an hour, and it tends to push this whoop around, this three inch whoop, the semi whoop. So um, I want her actually, it flies a lot better when I have her in full rate mode, and then she can use the, the alt hold and the position hold. And she has a lot better control of the quadcopter. And the wind doesn't push it around as much. So that's what I'm doing here. Okay. Don't copy this. I'm just showing you the different things here. So your, your position hold, obviously, what that is, is your GPS is holding it in a, in a certain position. And your alt hold is your the elevation, wherever you have it set at, when you turn it on. Um, you know, when you turn it on and wherever you set your throttle at. And then I have a return to home 
just because I put it on there. She's not going to need that. She's not going to be flying too far away from her anyway right now. But a lot of you might be interested in that. On adjustments, I just leave that alone. GPS. Okay, so GPS is, is clearly showing where exactly I'm at in Great Falls, Montana. And as you can see, our town is set up north, south, east, or west, so it's correct already. But I did check this with um, Google Earth, and the town is a little off from True North. Um, you have right here your GPS, you know, it's reporting back right now. The altitude is 1,065 meters. That's the, al the actual um, elevation we're at in this town. Longitude, latitude, all that stuff. There's no speed, so there should be nothing showing up here. I now have nine sats because I'm in my basement, which is crazy. It's, it picks up nine. And that's all this is. And different arrows. If you have a lot of arrows or errors and timeouts, it'll show right here. And that, that could be because of the, you have a lot of interference on your quadcopter for whatever reason. So you want to pay attention to those if you're having problems. Mission control, we're not going to play around with. Your OSD, you want to set that up however you want. Come on, bring it up. Okay, however you want. Um, I'm running SharkBite, so I don't really have a lot of options to begin with. SharkBite does have, you know, it does show the actual home arrow, where to point to. It has the home, you know, how the distance from home, the home point where it took off at, or where I plugged the battery in at. It uh, says 14 satellites on here now. That's kind of crazy. And so on and so forth. That's how I have it set up. But your system messages on SharkBite, you're not going to get that right now until um, iNav supports Canvas mode for SharkBite, which hopefully that happens in 3.0. Carla DiviMath did send over the code for that to happen, so we'll see. Um, your LEDs, who cares about LEDs? Um, and then your black box settings and stuff, which you already know what that's about. So that's it, guys. That's all you really have to know about iNav. And you can see here, I got everything lit up. I have gyro, accelerometer, the mag, which is the compass, the, the barometer, and the GPS. It all is lit up. I have no messages up here that telling me, hey, there's a problem here. Everything's light, lit up right here. And you might not get navigation as safe if you don't have any satellites, like in your basement or wherever you're located, but that's okay. Just take it outside and see if it picks up any satellites. If it has a cloudy day or if you have a lot of rain clouds above you or snow clouds, it's going to have a harder time, of course. So that's it, guys. That's, that's the quickest way I can tell you before going outside and having an experience in the flyaway how to set up your compass. Don't trust the arrows. Okay, so we're outside. And you can see here the wind gust is 10 miles an hour of the west, 15 mile an hour gusts, and the temperature is 23 degrees Fahrenheit. Alt hold is on, stay, or, uh, position hold, and um, in stabilize mode. It's so very stable. The problem is, is it tends to push around the quadcopter. But I'm just, I'm just trying to test things out here and see how the, um, the return to home works. So I'm going to click on return to home and auto land. Shoots up to 55 feet, 52 feet. And as you can see, it lands pretty damn slow um, as it's landing. Now this is something you have to be cautious about. Um, when you're setting, you there's actually a setting in iNav, and you can set the descent to a lot higher rate of descent but you have to remember that your quadcopter could get trapped up in its own prop wash and it makes the quadcopter inherently unstable and if you go too fast it can actually cause your quadcopter to lose control and uh, that's actually happened to me before on my camera drones and it caused a pretty serious crash this thing's built like a tank so i'm not really too concerned about it Okay, over here, I'm just flying over the neighbor's property. It's snowing today. You'll start to see some snow here soon. It's really bad. Um, auto return home and land. And this one was actually done in um, horizon mode. So I'm trying to play with the different modes here. I'm trying to get them set so they're not so stabilized and the sticks aren't so mushy. 
So the, the quadcopter stops to stabilize itself before landing. And then it starts coming down slower and slower. And the wind was starting to die down here because the, it's going to start snowing. And it doesn't bounce up. Sometimes, you know, with some of these quadcopters, when they start to land and they hit the ground, they actually bounce around. That's what was happening uh, years ago. This one actually works out pretty good. So in full rate mode and air mode, stabilization off, alt hold is off, position hold is off. So everything is off right now. And I'm just going to go ahead and fly around a little bit. And I actually did quite a bit of flying here. I think I chopped it down. You can see the flag, the American flag right there is absolutely still right now. Um, so, I mean, the quadcopter still has a lot of potential for a beginner or intermediate to be able to just to fly around. It's really smooth, very easy to control. Um, you know, I have years of experience to do this stuff, but still, I mean, it, it really does fly very stable. It's a whoop. It's a three inch whoop. That's heavy. So, you know, for if, for sin whoop, it's actually pretty good. It's very, very smooth. I mean, if you had hyper smooth or super smooth, now the flag's starting to go. You can see that. The wind's starting to kick up. Um, if you actually had a GoPro and uh, you put some smoothing on there and stuff, this would be pretty good footage. I almost hit that power line there. That would have been fun. And the run cam, it's cloudy day. The run cam is doing its thing. This is shark bite. You know, the run cam is what it is. The shark bite system is what it is. It's dependent on cameras that, you know, they're, they're not, I mean, these are micro cameras. They're not 19 by 19 cameras, so they're not too bad, but still, plastic lens. And I kick on the auto return home. Now, this time around, I did set it so that it would uh, descent a little bit faster. I put the descent a little bit faster. So it starts to descend down. And the prop wash, yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, it'll stop right about here. And then it lands. So everything works. And I don't know why the video did this. It's really weird. All right, so we're back out here with Shannon. And she is doing good. Um, some things about INAV, though, that I didn't know about. But it's, it's acting kind of funny today. We do have a wind. So it's not really easy but the thing about it is is that if she gets in trouble she can just let go of the sticks but she's actually flying she's doing really good with the loops she's doing really good with uh, she's doing really good I mean I went out there she flew, t flew toward me and then when she got to me she just flipped it right around and she's flying really really good so the other thing is too is I had it in stabilized mode and then I had it in alt hold mode and position hold hold mode and it was just acting really mushy on the sticks and so but yeah she's doing really really well okay so this is her flight um, it's a little windy see the grass moving a little bit the wind is coming out of the uh, the west and the thing is is when I you know about this flight I I put it in rate mode um instead of instead of any kind of a stabilization mode and air mode is on as well and once she's up i put it in alt hold and i put it in uh, position hold so that way if she gets in trouble she can just let go of the sticks now as you can see there's quite a di quite a bit of a difference in image quality on this video as opposed to the one i was flying around the house that is my fault. Um, I was actually playing around with the lens because I was going to upgrade her lens. I had a lens that came in that was the, um, I did a video on it. it it's another Caddx um, Retel version one lens. And because I knew it was going to snow the next day and start getting really, really windy here in a couple hours, I just slapped the stock lens back on and I thought I had it focused properly and you can clearly see I didn't. Um, it's very, very out of focus. So that's my bad. Um, I just, I wanted to get out here and get her first flight done. 
because our weather has been completely bipolar. I mean, one minute it's snowing, the next minute it's high winds. This was the nicest day we've had in quite a few weeks, to be honest with you. And the grass is not wet or anything like that, so it's it's good weather for trying to fly something. Um, and the wind actually died down a little bit. So the wind right now today, or as she's flying here, is roughly about six miles an hour out of the west. So it, it is kind of pushing her around a little bit. She's got to compensate for that. And that's what she's trying to learn here. So Shannon's got, I had her in a simulator, but she didn't like the simulator. And um, she just she just didn't like it. I, I tried it with the um, fat sharks. I tried it on her screen. She just simply didn't like it. And, it, you know, if you don't like something, I'm not going to force somebody to do something that they don't like. So she only has maybe a little over an hour in the flight simulator. And most of that hour was not being happy in the flight simulator, to be honest with you. So, you know... What the hell? Let's just go out and try it, you know. And that's that's what you're seeing here, where she is just learning right now. I think we've all been there where we our first flight when we've ever flown a quadcopter, we didn't know what to expect. Um, of course, we didn't have alt hold. Most of us didn't, unless you were flying camera drones. But most of us didn't have alt hold, and most of us didn't have uh, position hold to rely on. Most of us just uh, crashed into the ground, bent a bunch of props up, maybe broke an arm and so on and so forth, and learned the hard way. Some of us were smart and actually started in a simulator, but very few of us. So she's just trying to learn how this works and trying to compensate for the wind that's pushing her around. And she starts learning pretty quick. That's the one thing I like about my wife is the fact that she does learn very fast she's a very fast learner but she's never flown anything before um, she operated RC cars when I had the RC car track here in town and she did really well at it other than she didn't know how to pass people um, so we had to I had to get her an 8 scale Losi monster truck and I put a 28 uh, sized engine in it, a real high hopped up engine and that way she could just run people over, and that's pretty much what she did. Instead of passing them, she would just run right over the top of them. So, but she did really well. I mean, she she honestly did. I think she won first prize in the championship, actually, that year. So she is a very fast learner. And you can see she's progressively getting better. She's, she's starting to figure out the yaw stick and the um, roll, you know, the roll here and what they're doing. And I'm, and I'm also kind of coaching her a little bit, too. But for the most part, I don't want to frustrate her. And you know how it is. You know, if you're a husband or a boyfriend, you know how it is. I mean, it can be really frustrating when you're talking to a woman and it sounds like you're mansplaining. So that's it, guys. I hope you liked this video. If you did, give me a thumbs up. Please subscribe. And I got more stuff coming. Have yourself a great night.